August 25th, 1991, a young Linus Torvalds posted to the Minix Usenet group about a project he was working on that was just a hobby and won't be big and professional like GNU. On this day, he unveiled the Linux kernel to the world, or at least to the handful of people in the Minix Usenet group. And then a few short years later, on July 16th, 1993, the legendary Slackware was born. I, and many others, have mistakenly called it the oldest Linux distro. This is definitely not the case. There is at least five distros, and two other things which you could argue are maybe a distro that predate it by at least a year. All of those projects, for a very long time now, have been very, very dead though. But as of a couple of days ago, Slackware had another birthday. This makes it for another year the oldest surviving Linux distro, turning 30 years old. Now, in case you're curious, the second oldest surviving distro is Debian, only being beaten by a couple of months. That project started on September 15th, 1993. So when that birthday rolls around, expect a fairly similar video about Debian instead. So I thought, hey, to commemorate the occasion, let's look back at how it all started. How was Slackware made, who made it, and why was it made? So Slackware was created by Patrick Volkerding, born on October 20th, 1966. He was awarded his Bachelor of Science by the Minnesota State University Moorhead. In the project, he is informally known as the man, and more officially known as Slackware's BDFL, the Benevolent Dictator for Life. And even until this day, he is still running the project. Now maybe it's just me, but the first thing I wondered is what's the deal with the name? Why Slackware? Well, initially the project wasn't intended to be taken seriously, but over the years, the name kind of just stuck. So, Patrick is a member of the Church of the Subgenius, and that is a whole topic unto itself, and I'm sure there is plenty of YouTube videos on it. But as a TLDR, it is a parody religion that satirizes better known belief systems. One of its tenets is the pursuit of Slack. It is software pursuing Slack, it is Slackware. Slackware. Now, the figurehead of this religion is a character known as J.R. Bob Dobbs. The Bob is very important. It must always be in quotation marks. It must always be in the name. Now, you'll see this character referenced in the mascot for Slackware, being Tux smoking a pipe. And there have been various other references placed in the distro over the years. And to be honest, that's probably a whole video unto itself. But in this one, I also want to talk about other things. When I said there were distros that predated Slackware, I didn't just say that as a random offhand comment. I said it because Slackware was based on one of them. SLS, or Soft Landing Linux System, created by Peter McDonald. This contained a comprehensive software suite, allowing for things like X11 support, TCPIP support, UUCP support, it had GNU Emacs, it had the GNU Userland, it was a Linux distro. Now, none of that sounds that impressive by today's standards, but for back then, this was a really big deal to have everything bundled together. This project's been dead for a very, very long time, but for that short period of time when it did live, it was a really, really popular Linux distro. Now, keep in mind, that's in the context of really popular before Slackware, Debian, Red Hat, or anything that we know today exists. It was popular amongst the very small handful of people that were using Linux at the time. The reason it was so popular is how complete the software suite was, and the soft landing part of the name comes into that as well. It was supposed to be a soft landing from those migrating over from DOS. Once again, that kind of ages the system as well. The problem is whilst there was a lot of software, the distro was considered to be fairly buggy and also not that well maintained. So whilst there was a lot of software, a lot of it got very quickly out of date. And at the time, Patrick was still a student at the Minnesota State University Moorhead and also a user of SLS. 
Now, much of this origin of slackware is going to be taken from two interviews. One from the Sydney Morning Herald in 2002, and another from LinuxJournal.com in 1994. In case you were curious just how quickly slackware became popular, this is how quickly. At the time, Patrick was in need of a Lisp interpreter. Why exactly he needed it isn't entirely clear, but judging by the rest of the story, it was likely for one of his classes. He discovered that CLisp was available for use over on SLS. He installed the system, and it did the job clearly. But as anyone would do as you're using a newly developing technology, he was talking about it. And a few weeks later, his AI professor was interested and asked Patrick how to set up Linux. He was looking to do so on his home computers and a small portion of the university's computers because Unix was already massive at this time. But this new Linux thing was gaining a bit of popularity and maybe it makes sense for the university to at least experiment with it. So he did exactly that. He helped out his professor, along with making a bunch of notes on how to get SLS in a good state. Updating software, fixing bugs, things like this. The problem <laughs> is there was so much wrong with SLS that doing the fixes took basically as long as installing the distro. Now, SLS didn't have a package manager, which wouldn't matter because the packages would have been out of date anyway. So what you would have to do if you wanted to update the software is download the source code and compile it yourself. Now, because the professor had some level of respect for his time, he asked, hey, is there any possibility to automate these changes during the install process? This became the prequel, the origin, the catalyst, whatever term you want to use, of Slackware, but at this point, it's generally not considered the start date of the project. It was still a private thing between Patrick and this professor. Going forward, he continued upgrading packages, fixing bugs, fixing permission issues, upgrading the kernel, upgrading shared libraries, and all of this other stuff to make the system actually good. By the time he was done, he had upgraded half the entire software on the system. Even with that clearly showing that SLS was not in a good state at the time, he had absolutely no intention to initially release it, because he felt like he didn't need to, saying at the time SLS would be putting out a new version that included these things soon enough. Luckily though, he had friends that urged him to change his mind. So at least go and make a post and ask the community about it. He made a post titled, anyone want an SLS like 0.99 PL11A system, which is a really long way of saying, do you want me to fork this system and maintain it myself? And to his surprise, he got a lot of positivity. The problem is it was 1993, and unlike today where if you need a server, you can just go to any random VPS company, give them $5, and you have a server in the next 30 seconds. Back at this time, it required a little bit more work. Luckily, he was a university student, so he went to the local admin at his university and asked for permission to upload Slackware to their FTP server, and that admin agreed. On that day, Slackware 1.0 was released to the public as 24 three and a half inch floppy images. And it also killed their FTP server, because he didn't expect it would be so popular so quickly. Because people really wanted an updated version of SLS. But luckily it wasn't down for good. Patrick was offered support by Walnut Creek CD-ROM, and later in the story, they are going to be very important. Moving into the mid-90s, we saw the continued growth of Linux, and we also saw the rise of some of the early commercial Linux distros, things like Caldera, Red Hat, and it existed slightly before Slackware, Yggdrasil. By today's standards, their profit was absolutely tiny, but two or three years prior, there was no commercial Linux. All of a sudden, this new industry was just spawning out of nowhere, and Linux was getting more and more popular, and Patrick was paying attention to this. During this period, Patrick was approached by Michael Johnston of Morse Telecommunications, who wanted to sell copies of Slackware. Now, prior to this point, Slackware was a completely non-commercial venture. But, seeing the success of these commercial distros, 
and it becoming kind of clear that maybe some level of funding would be a good idea, he said, okay, let's do it. The contract they had was for six months and wasn't exactly a great one. He was being offered one USD per copy sold. Now, plenty of copies did sell, but one USD per copy. You have to sell a lot of slackware to make a reasonable amount of money from that. Afterwards, he moved to another vendor, Walnut Creek CD-ROM. This was a company formed by Bob Bruce, which honestly is a great name. And for any of you guys who've been around for a really long time, you probably recognize the thing they ran. The biggest FTP site at the time, ftp.cdrom.com. This was famous for distributing FreeBSD, id games, and other things like that, alongside Slackware. They were a massive distributor of freeware and shareware, also becoming one of the first companies to sell free software. One of those things being Slackware. For a short period, this was a relatively successful endeavor. The problem is something that Patrick had no ability to stop. The end of the 90s, when the dot-com bubble burst, and when that happened, a lot of tech companies went with it. One of those companies being Walnut Creek. They ended up merging with BSDI and eventually being acquired by Wind River. Now, Wind River is still around today and does do a lot of stuff with Linux, but at the time, they were a lot more interested in BSD and didn't really care to distribute Slackware. This left Slackware without a publisher once again, right before a release was going to happen. But Patrick was on really good terms with Bob, and from my understanding is still today. So they teamed up to form Slackware Inc. to self-publish Slackware, and from then on, the rest is pretty much history. Even since the rise of Debian and Red Hat, but especially since the rise of Ubuntu, Fedora, and all of these other distros, Slackware has generally fallen out of favor, and it's not entirely due to these other distros just being better. Over the years, the developers had various health concerns, and there has been this general lack of support during certain periods. There have been a few instances where it seemed like the project was just completely dead and nothing was going to happen. Every single time, though, Patrick has come back and the project has slowly moved forward again. Whilst it is still moving fairly slowly today, it is still very much alive, with the latest release being February 2022. So congratulations to Slackware for surviving 30 years. I hope 30 years later, the project is still going. So let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below. Are you a Slackware user, maybe a modern Slackware user, or maybe a classic Slackware user that wants to tell your story? I would love to know. Let me know in the comment section down below. And if you liked the video, go like the video. And if you really liked the video and you want to become one of these amazing people over here, check out the Patreon, Scribe, Sully, Bearer, Pay, linked in the description down below. That's going to be it for me, and pursue Slack. Yeah.